this third part of the lecture, I'll consider some specific applications of qualitative evaluation methods, including in the context of participatory research and randomized controlled trials. I'll also discuss mixed methods approaches. I'd like to start by discussing briefly participatory approaches. The active participation of patients and the public is increasingly seen as important for health service planning and delivery. Initiatives such as expert patient programs are one example of this. In low and middle income country contexts, considerable efforts have been made to involve patients and their carers in service provision, particularly around HIV AIDS and antiretroviral treatment. But other kinds of programs such as community or lay health worker programs also attempt to involve patients or the public more actively in their own health care. Public participation is also increasingly recognized as important for research and evaluation in particular. It has been suggested that this focus on participation has been important in promoting the use of qualitative approaches in evaluation. And I think the large number of studies of consumer experiences of different healthcare programs demonstrate this. And as I go on in the lecture, I'll try and illustrate why qualitative methods have particular strengths for looking at participation, but also for building participation in research. Participatory research methods go further by attempting to involve users or other stakeholders in the research process itself. This may include involving research participants in framing the evaluation questions, but also involving them in interpreting the findings and sometimes in data collection and analysis. These sorts of participatory research approaches emerged from feminist critiques of research, which, highli which highlighted power imbalances between, on the one hand, researchers, and, on the other hand, those who were the subjects of research. These critiques suggested that research participants were often disempowered by the research process, and were seen as the objects of research rather than as participants in it. And these critiques highlighted the need for a different model that was less disempowering of research participants. Participatory approaches in evaluation can be seen as having a number of strengths. Firstly, they can build stakeholder commitment to the research um, by involving key stakeholders in deciding on and framing the research questions and in choosing methods appropriate to exploring those questions. Participatory approaches may also provide additional insights regarding the research question through building more trusting research, researcher participant relations. In other words, through building better interactions um, and more trusting interactions between researchers and those people they are working with. Participants in research may be more willing to share their own experiences of a particular intervention or program. And thirdly, participatory approaches can build capacity among participants um, by involving them in the research process. The literature also acknowledges a number of weaknesses of participatory approaches. These include that it is time-consuming and difficult, often, to include high levels of participation and that this approach, indeed, makes assumptions regarding the roles of different stakeholders, particularly that different stakeholders will be in agreement with one another and will be able to work together. This may not be the case in many settings where there may be important differences between different groups of stakeholders, for example, those who are supportive of childhood vaccination and those who hold strong views against childhood vaccination. And these kinds of differences may be very difficult to manage within a participatory research approach. Participatory research may also be seen by some as less objective because it involves participants much more um, integrally in shaping the research process. Finally, may, this kind of method may create tensions if the research findings do not match stakeholders' expectations. So in other words, research participants may have particular strong views on what underlies a problem 
which may not actually be borne out by the research in the field, and this may create conflict in the interpretation of the data. You might want to spend a couple of minutes considering research studies in which you've been involved, and whether more participatory approaches could have strengthened these studies. In addition, in addition to participatory approaches, qualitative methods are increasingly used alongside randomized controlled trials of healthcare interventions. As you know, randomized controlled trials are used extensively to evaluate both clinical and health system and public health interventions. Um, indeed, the use of randomized controlled trials and other large-scale quantitative comparative evaluations to consider the effects of health service and public health interventions is becoming more common. There are many published uh, randomized controlled trials now of interventions to improve the organization of care and of interventions to change the financing or governance of health care services. Although qualitative studies alongside these randomized control trials are not yet common, indeed most trials don't include qualitative components, there's great interest in how they can be used more frequently within this context. The use of qualitative methods alongside trials might be particularly important for more complex interventions, such as those involving patient behaviors, for example adherence to treatment, those involving health system changes, such as the free care policy that I described earlier in the lecture, and those involving public health interventions, such as campaigns to reduce smoking rates or to promote safer driving. And qualitative methods can play a number of roles alongside trials of these sorts of complex health interventions. I'd like to spend a couple of minutes just exploring what sorts of roles qualitative methods might play in this context. I've divided this into three components. Firstly, the roles that qualitative methods might play before a randomized controlled trial, the functions qualitative methods can fulfill during the trial, and then how we can use these methods after a trial has been completed. Before a trial, there are at least three different ways in which qualitative methods can be used. They may be helpful um, in identifying new opportunities and hypotheses for intervention. For example, Qualitative work may suggest that peer support is helpful in maintaining medication adherence by people with chronic diseases, such as diabetes or hypertension. And this could be the basis for further work to develop peer support interventions, for example, those de delivered through family members or those developed through community or those delivered through community or lay health workers. Secondly, qualitative approaches may be used in developing and piloting new health programs. These studies are often small-scale studies looking, for example, at the effects of a quality improvement intervention in one general practice or a hospital ward. In the example I gave earlier of um, looking at interprofessional collaboration on hospital wards, you could imagine how that study might lead to a small intervention to promote better collaboration between nurses and doctors in acute medicine wards. And thirdly, qualitative approaches may be useful in identifying relevant outcome measures for trials. For example, based on the endpoints identified as important both by users of health services and by clinicians. And this may help to get around some of the limitations of trials in which the outcomes identified as important by clinicians are often not seen as that important by patients. For example, many trials of interventions to improve back pain have measured outcomes that are not considered important to patients. Patients may value outcomes such as the ability to do day-to-day -day activities, going shopping, walking to a friend, whereas clinicians may value outcomes such as degree of movement or quantitative evaluations of amount of pain. By using qualitative methods, one might be able to identify outcomes that are both valued by clinicians and health service users or people with a particular health condition. How might qualitative methods be used during a trial? I think there are a number of ways in which they may be useful. Firstly, in examining the implementation process. What is the pathway or mechanism between implementing an intervention and the outcome measured in the trial? How do we explain the path through which that intervention worked? Secondly, these approaches may be useful in exploring the perceptions of different participants regarding the intervention. What do nurses think about it? What do healthcare 
other healthcare providers think about it. Third, they can be used to examine whether the program has been implemented as intended, and if not, how it differs from what was planned. In a recent study in which I was involved, we attempted to use financial incentives, in this case small vouchers, to improve people's adherence to TB treatment. In this study, nurses were asked to give vouchers to patients um, who had completed a month of TB treatment. Every month when patients came to the clinic to collect their new um, batch of medication, their adherence was assessed and if nurses felt that they were adhering adequately, they received a voucher that they could use in a local store. When we started to evaluate the implementation of the intervention, we found that nurses were not giving the voucher to all of the patients um, who were eligible for it. In interviewing nurses, we found that they were indeed rationing the use of the voucher, and this was because nurses felt that the voucher, like other scarce resources in healthcare, should be given to those who needed it most. They were therefore giving the voucher to people who they considered to be poorer or to have particular family or household needs. The use of qualitative methods in this context help us, helped us to understand why the intervention that we planned was not being implemented as intended. Qualitative methods can also be used to explore the contextual, social and individual factors affecting implementation and also whether the program affects subgroups in different ways. Coming back to my earlier example, are there different ways in which po poorer TB patients or those who are somewhat wealthier um, experience an intervention that provides vouchers to them? Um, similarly, how would they, would they experience intervention of treatment support in a different way? How might we use qualitative methods after a trial? They can be useful, for example, in exploring the effects of a program on outcomes that are difficult to measure quantitatively, such as the effects of health interventions on social networks in the, inf in the example I gave earlier. The approaches can also be used to explore the reasons for differential effects across different groups or sites. For example, why a program to reduce smoking has more impact among high income than low income groups. Finally, qualitative methods can be useful in developing models to explain the mechanisms of the effect of an intervention. For example, the pathways through which a training program for nurses implements, uh, impacts on clinical practice. As you can see, these uses of qualitative methods mirror the ways in which these methods can be used within evaluation more, more generally. The use of qualitative methods alongside trials is therefore no different from the use of qualitative methods in evaluation more broadly. Apart from the fact that one's trying to bring into juxtaposition the results of this qualitative data and the results of the trial itself. There are of course a number of challenges to this and these are in some ways quite similar to the challenges of mixed res method research in general which I'll be discussing in a few minutes. Some of these challenges include differing expectations of trialists or qualitative researchers regarding what qualitative methods can offer in the context of a trial, as well as the challenge of the complexity of explanatory pathways for the effects of interventions. Indeed, there may be a range of competing explanations that can be considered for why an intervention works or doesn't work, or indeed how it works, and this makes the, the process of developing explanatory pathways quite challenging for any kind of intervention. Having introduced this idea of mixed method evaluation in which we combine both qualitative and quantitative approaches, I'd like to go on now to say a little bit more about the rationales for mixed method evaluation and how one might understand it from a conceptual perspective. Mixed method evaluations have a long history in the field of evaluation. Although we con could consider a whole range of methods, including qualitative, quantitative, economic, I'll be talking today about m mixing qualitative and quantitative approaches specifically. There are many rationales for mixing qualitative and quantitative methods in evaluation. Firstly, different methods can best address different evaluation questions. You will recall that in part one of the lecture, I outlined some of the steps in deciding what methods and forms of data collection should be used for a particular research question, and try to make the point that the, the methods chosen um, should be chosen in because they help to gather data that would appropriately and robust, robustly address your research question. 
if your research question, it may often be the case that your research question will require a range of different methods to address it fully and robustly. Secondly, given the complexity of many social phenomena, including the, some of the examples I've described in the lecture, mixing methods can provide a more comprehensive and rigorous description and, and understanding of the effects of an intervention and allow the corroboration of ideas from one approach to another. And this is sometimes called data triangulation. You'll be hearing more about this concept of triangulation later in the course. Following from this, mixing methods can help to reduce the limitations of single method approaches by approaching a research question from different directions. And I'll be saying a little bit about more about this in a moment. Mixed methods may have further advantage that the differences between findings from different methods can be used to identify areas requiring further investigation. For example, if a qualitative study shows one set of findings and the quantitative evaluation a somewhat different set of findings, it raises the question as to why and this can help to identify areas in which further research work is needed. And of course, funding uh, demands from funders or commissioning agencies have been important in increasing the number of mixed method evaluations. Many funders now demand that health service evaluations consider both qualitative and quantitative approaches. A range of typologies of mixed method designs have been proposed. Although these can be useful in providing an overview of how different methods can be used, in practice many evaluations do not fit neatly into these categories. For those who are interested in different models of mixed method designs, please have a look at the relevant readings. Mixing qualitative and quantitative approaches raises a number of epistemological issues within evaluation research. This is because these different approaches are rooted in different understandings of the social world. Qualitative approaches are rooted in a more interpretative, interpretivist understanding of the social world, which suggests that there's no one single explanation for social phenomena or events. On the other hand, quantitative approaches are often rooted within a more positivist understanding of the social world, which suggests that we can measure and understand and reach a truth, if you like, um, about a particular social phenomenon or event. In other words, that we can understand or develop a single rational and comprehensive explanation about why something works or doesn't work. Some researchers have taken a rather purist approach to these debates. They suggest that it's not useful or sensible to mix paradigms within a single study, as these different viewpoints or understandings of the social world represent fundamentally different ways of knowing, and therefore cannot be combined in a single study. More commonly, though, evaluators, um, and I would place myself within this category, take a much more pragmatic approach. This acknowledges these philosophical differences between paradigms, but also suggests that practical considerations of what would be best to address the research question within the resources available are the most important considerations. In other words, this comes back to the point that I raised earlier, that we need to select the best methods to address the research questions and objectives identified. To some extent, this divide between qualitative and quantitative approaches, or between the interpretivist and positive, positivist paradigms, is artificial, and most research approaches can be seen as a continuum between these different stances. It's also worth noting that methods, in other words procedures for gathering or analyzing data, are not intrinsically linked to any particular paradigm. It is possible, for example, to use more quantitative approaches within an interpretivist paradigm and vice versa. Given these debates within research methodology, it's not surprising that there are a number of critiques of mixed method approaches. I've already touched on the paradigmatic critique, which suggests that these approaches are incommensurate and should not be used together. And I've noted how um, many researchers take a more pragmatic 
approach to this problem, rather than um, the purest view that interpretivist and positivist approaches should not be used together or cannot be used together within a particular project or research question. A second critique is that mixing methods ends up not doing justice to any one approach and may consequently undermine the quality of evaluations. In other words, by trying to do too much, one, does, one doesn't do any one of those particular methods sufficiently well. A third critique is that combining the findings of qualitative evaluation with those of other evaluation components creates many challenges. And this means that it is difficult to draw these findings together in a coherent way. And I'll come back to this critique in a few moments. Of course, using different methods requires high levels of expertise within the research team, and this in turn has costs. Implementing such evaluations can also be very time-consuming because they involve a whole range of different forms of data collection and analysis. I'm sure you can think of other critiques of mixed methods approach, approaches. You may want to spend a few minutes thinking about some of the projects in which you've been involved which, and which included a range of different methods. What were some of the strengths and what were some of the weaknesses of those research endeavours? Are there things that you might have done differently in terms of the way you selected and mixed methods in those projects? To illustrate some of the points I've been making in this section of the lecture, I'd like to give an example of a project that used both qualitative and quantitative data, and indeed where the findings from these qualitative and quantitative analyses disagrees. This is an interesting example because of these discrepancies. Um, and I think highlights some of the ways in which these methods can be used in a complementary and um, way that strengthens the overall research output. As a bit of background, um, many older people in the study setting, in this case in the United Kingdom, are eligible for welfare benefits, but do not claim these. And indeed this is true in many other contexts. For example, in South Africa, many people eligible um, for welfare grants or um, pensioners who are eligible um, for old age grants do not claim these from social services. The research question that this particular project was exploring was, does improved access to and uptake of benefits lead to health improvements in the elderly? The researchers implemented an intervention to improve access to and uptake of benefits among the elderly. Each participant in the research received an assessment of their welfare status and their benefits and what benefits they were entitled to um, by a welfare officer and then received assistance in making claims for those benefits. The evaluation of this intervention had two components. Firstly, the researchers conducted a randomized controlled trial which included about 100 people, um, half of which were uh, randomized to receive support from a welfare officer, as I described, and the other half who received just their routine day-to-day um, -day activities. The outcomes measured were measures of physical and psychosocial health. In the qualitative study, interviews were conducted with participants, and these interviews focused on their perceptions of the impacts of the financial benefits, impacts on health, and the social benefits of the intervention. So what were the findings of this research? The randomized controlled trial found little evidence of differences in health and social outcomes between the group that had received support from the welfare officer in terms of understanding and claiming their benefits and those people who hadn't. The qualitative research, however, suggested wide-ranging positive impacts of the intervention. In trying to understand this discrepancy, the authors came up with the following explanation. Firstly, they suggested the randomized control trial was small, as you'll recall it included only 100 people, and not all the intervention participants received their benefits within the time frame of the trial. Secondly though, and more importantly, they suggested that the qualitative study captured a number of dimensions that were not actually measured in the trial. For example, 
factors or dimensions such as maintaining independence through being able to afford health at home as a result of the benefits and having better access to facilities. Some of the quantitative measures of mental health did not actually capture all of the dimensions of pr improvement that were reported by participants in the qualitative study. The researchers concluded that although these mixed method, this mixed method research led to what could be seen as conflicting accounts, the exploration of the reasons for these differences resulted in different conclusions regarding the intervention than would have been drawn from a single study alone. Had they just done the trial, they would have concluded that this intervention didn't work. But by combining the trial with qualitative evaluation, it became clearer that the intervention may indeed have some important benefits for research participants, and that some of these ben benefits could have been measured had the trial continued for longer, or had the trial included quantitative measurement of outcomes that were considered important by the research participants. In this part of the lecture, I've discussed specific applications of qualitative evaluation methods, including participatory approaches, the use of qualitative methods alongside trials, and more broadly, mixed method approaches. These specific applications illustrate the wide range of purposes for which qualitative methods can be used in the context of evaluation. In the next and final part of the lecture, I'll reflect on the use of qualitative methods in the context of evaluation and try to draw some